humans are the only animals who wear materials not natural to them. Then what basic virtues should the lower animals expect in human clothes? Durability, of course. A certain blending with the background. Surely the freedom to move naturally and hopefully protection against predators. But wait, how can one make sense of the history of clothing and fashion without first understanding human vanity, the hunger for social status, and sometimes the functional? Let's try. Under the perpetual sun of ancient Egypt, only light materials are worn, with accessories, and over a shaven head, a magnificent wig made of horses' tails. Three and a half thousand years ago, women were already improving on nature. A transparent shift to finest linen, the calasiris. The golden hawk is the symbol of the queen. And the serpent represents him, the pharaoh. For all males, an apron. For the pharaoh, one of gold. Gold with a richly decorated belt. And finally, a false beard. A real beard would be unkempt. For the hunt, simplicity. An apron and a transparent tunic. While for formal affairs, complexity. A rainbow of color and brilliant accessories. Sandals are the privilege of the pharaoh and the priests. Even the queen goes barefoot. Now we sail away, or row, to Crete, the cradle of European culture. Here the apron is worn, but with a pendant. Calories are not counted, but the men of Crete become famous for their small waists. And the women? for the first corsets in history. In neighboring Greece, the history of Hellenic costume can be read on the vases which have survived the centuries. The young Greek, an athlete, loves the naked body and freedom of movement. When he dresses, he may choose of homespun wool, the short cloak, or the short chiton, forerunner of today's shirts. The long chiton is worn only by elders, and over the chiton, a long mantle. In classical Greece, wool is replaced by linen. Buttons are still unknown. So a clasp is used to fasten a woman's robe, the peplus, at the shoulder. Pleats on skirts show the influence of Central Asia. Now add to that a little female ingenuity in the art of making folds. And as for hairstyles, the Greeks certainly have imagination. Even male dress takes on pleats, while philosophers wear only a long cloak, the hymatian. The Roman first appears on the stage of history in a sleeveless tunic. The elaborate toga becomes popular for 700 years. Later, only aristocrats and freemen may wear it. Ave. Let's see how women dress in Rome. At home, the noblewoman wears a tunic and sandals. Stop, you can't go out like that. 
only a slave would dress so simply. We also need a stola, much like a Greek robe, a cloak, and perhaps a veil. That looks better. Now you may go outside. A new look finally comes to Rome. The full wide sleeve tunic from Dalmatia. The toga takes on exaggerated proportions. More than five yards of cloth are needed and a special method of folding. We'll return to the barbarians with their vulgar, covered legs when they learn how to dress. But now to the Roman Empire in the east, Byzantium. From Western Roman dress, Byzantium takes the cloak and tunic. In Constantinople, here's a nobleman in a short tunic, stockings, and long cloak. A rectangular ornament on the cloak, the tablion, is an insignia of official rank and type of service. The imperial tablion is of inlaid gold. The emperor is resplendent with gold and jewels. For sheer opulence, Byzantine clothing has never been surpassed. The simple lines of Byzantine gracefulness do not clash with the colorful designs. The empress shines in a constellation of gold and precious gems. With the smuggling by Byzantine monks of the miraculous silkworm out of China in 550 AD, the 3,000-year-old mystery of how the Chinese made silk suddenly ended. Turn again to the barbarians in Rome. It's hopeless. The era of the toga passes forever. Only a simple cloak remains. His braco are a forerunner of our present day trousers. And perhaps our ski pants? This is the beginning of the Middle Ages and the Romanesque period, with tunic and cloak again dominant, but longer for priests and kings. Romanesque sharply distinguishes male and female clothing. The cloak closes to become a cape. Uh, the hood, ah, uh, fashion, it becomes longer and longer. Where's your lady friend? Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Gothic brings the distinction between male and female to a minimum. Intentionally or innocently, the movement of a woman's arms reveal the so-called hell's windows. Gothic women cultivate a figure S posture with chest in, stomach out. Then Gothic develops into a competition of extravagance among nobility. By the end of the Gothic period, dress is exaggerated in fantastic ways.
the lofty cornet with a veil. Shaving the hairline and eyebrows, covering all hair. Oh, the first low neckline since Crete. And a rich skirt with a very long train. The Renaissance, Renaissance returns man to reality. The Renaissance emphasizes the shape of the human body. The straight vertical lines of Gothic are broken by pleasant horizontal lines. Only older people keep the long dress. A pouch is suspended from a belt. It's still a long wait for the first pockets. And women in the Renaissance? Braids in a net, slashed sleeves, the train disappears. In place of solid colored broadcloth and wool, embroidered silk, brocade and velvet. The fashion of the Italian Renaissance bursts over Europe. Germans carry its inspiration over the Alps to their own country. Slashing is carried to an extreme. There are more openings than cloth. The women exaggerate slashing and folding. Man becomes a rectangular block of cloth. The proportionately wide shoulders of the Italians are widened enormously by Swiss-German fashion. Take a look at Henry VIII. And his wife? Note the details. That was a period of high fashion. In Spain, now a great European power, we come across the first knitted stockings in history and worn by men. His breeches, lined with stiff linen, look blown up. And some new changes in women's dress. The square neckline, the corset, and a split overskirt showing a rich brocade petticoat. Precious gems pour in from Spain's overseas colonies. Skirts begin to gather in ever fuller folds and collars appear in a new fabric, lace. And the senor, a tall feathered hat, a wheel of stiff lace, a vest lined with hair as well as the breeches and replacing all those petticoats, the first hooped skirt in history. The crinoline. With the beginning of the 17th century Baroque period, the now wealthy citizens of Flanders dictate European fashion. A new soft lace collar emphasizes a sloping shoulder. Women give up their hoops and again replace them with many layers of petticoats. Rich women spend a fortune on lace, and men do too. Long forgotten boots reappear. But with time, men again return to stockings and low shoes. He's covered from head to toe with ribbons. And women have not only liberated their necks, but also their shoulders. They say the clothes in Paris are marvelous. La plus nouvelle mode de Paris. 
and the France of Louis XIV is now the fashion center. Parisian dressmakers put their latest designs on mannequins to be sent throughout Europe. A French gentleman's makeup is as elaborate as his wife's. He bravely shaves his head to wear the fashionable wig. Now he's ready to be seen at the king's court. And an innovation which proves inviting, the first outside pocket in history. To compete with the male wig, French women shape their hair with wire, ribbons, and lace. The cloak is sewn to the dress. Female dress is in harmony with the ornate interior decorating of the period. With the coming of Rococo, the crinoline again becomes fashionable. Here is the construction of the new crinoline. Dresses from the era of Madame Pompadour with luxurious flounces adorned with ribbons and sprinkled with an abundance of artificial flowers. That's why they're called walking gardens. And now this uh, man, narrow shoulders, a stiff flaring overcoat and waistcoat beneath. A special way of tying bows and of powdering the short wig and face at the same time. <laughs> oh, sorry, we meant no offense. Women's legs. For the first time since ancient Greece, the hemline is raised above the ankles. This is the age of Louis the 16th. Parasols, gloves, variously shaped skirts, even walking sticks for women. And hair? Here fashion sails on a sea of imagination. The men are powdered and brightly colored. The right to wear red heels is conferred by special royal permission. The French Revolution buried the extravagant fashions of the old monarchy. Men of the directory wear a characteristic hat with a tricolor. Unkempt hair, a cravat around the neck, a coat with a large collar, tight pants, riding boots. For the first time, inspired by ancient Greece, the dress of another age is copied. Women enter the new classical period. At the beginning of the 19th century, France is ruled by Napoleon and satin. French silk is the best. The empire period gives women new grace. Hats are worn. And turbans. Man's two-peaked hat finally turns into the top hat. A man wearing long, wide pantaloons? Men of today, remember this historic date. The birthday of our trousers. After centuries, men's clothes of color, silk and ribbons slowly pass from favor as unmanly. But fashion finds new martyrs. This 
is Biedermeier, the era of middle-class prosperity. The middle of the 19th century. A stiff collar and tie replaced the cravat, which had been in style since the French Revolution. The Hamburg is born. And the male definitely excludes color from his wardrobe. Let's see what women wear. A cylindrical cap. And crinoline again. Oh, but madam, don't be embarrassed. Those looking at you are interested only in fashion. For the third time in history, the crinoline reappears to attempt a revival of the brilliance of France under Louis XIV. The revival is interrupted by the Industrial Revolution. The sewing machine gives birth to ready-made clothes. At the end of the 19th century, women begin to strongly stress their femininity. They emphasize the breasts, a small waist and hips, while the male costume stresses tallness and thinness. Now the first sport clothes finally appear. At the beginning of the 20th century, the S-shape returns. But the exact opposite of the Romanesque period, the new S-shape, or hourglass figure, is chest out, stomach in, thanks to the corset. Well, well, we finally reached the modern era. And there's already a smell of exhaust fumes in the air. In 1912, the combined efforts of doctors, dressmakers, and fashion designers topple the corset from its throne. There is a feverish attempt to find replacements for the now obsolete styles. Help arrives under influence from Japan. a shadow over problems of fashion. What's this? For the second time since ancient Greece, the hemline rises. Sensational. It rises and rises. Ah, uh, that's a little too high. Uh, progress stops in the Charleston era. of 1935 cause a new sensation, history's first low-cut backs. But World War II. The beginning of the atomic age. Our age. historical costumes stay on in pockets of tradition. We have told you the history of clothing up to yesterday. But the story of fashion today, tomorrow's history, is being written by you.